Hi, I'm Pat Dunn, and this is my vlog. Uh, it really sounds weird to say that word, vlog. It's not a natural sound, bleh, bleh. Doesn't even sound Russian, which has some of the odder permutations of sounds, at least from a uh, from a, uh, the perspective of an English speaker of any language that uh, that I know. Um, anyhow, so what's been going on? Um, so recently I watched a debate on Intelligence, uh, Intelligence Squared, which is a, it's an international group, or maybe it's just a coalition of separate internet, uh, of separate national groups that do Oxford style debates on a lot of topics relevant to a day, uh, or I mean relevant to the day. They ask questions about politics, about current events, occasionally about philosophy. Usually they're, they're quite good. Um, occasionally they're not so good, they get a bad speaker. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's usually two or three people on each side, and you have two sides. Um, and the goal is to move people from their initial opinion on the matter, to move more people towards your side. Whoever does that wins. It does open itself up to a certain amount of potential manipulation, because if you really want a side to win, you're always going to vote neutral at the start and then vote for them at the end so that you'll show off this motion. But um, yeah, generally they're pretty well done. Uh, last night I watched one that was particularly awful. It was based on uh, the premise, and each of them, there's a yes side and a no side, so the yes side gets the, the, the phrasing that they want. Um, and I think the, the phrasing of this one was, death is not the end. And it was just a really, really terrible debate. Uh, I mean, one of the things Intelligence Squared always does is that the debate is pretty civil. You don't have people saying, fuck you, because they got particularly angry uh, with each other. You don't end up having any of the garbage where some people will say, oh, the form of this debate is some type of reinforcement of uh, white patriarchy or some other bullshit like that. Uh, so I'm going to sing about uh, my position instead of debating you. Uh, no, you, you don't have any of that. You have proper debate, um, good back and forth on the topic. So you, you have some, uh, and, and it's civil. It doesn't devolve into insults. They have very active moderation, which I think you, you kind of need if you're going to do a debate well, um, and that the moderator will make sure, like if, if somebody asks a question of you and you dodge, the moderator will point out that you didn't ask the questions, kind of make you actually properly uh, address it, which is good. I, I think one of the things we really need in debate is very active moderation. You don't want the moderation to feel like it's coming to, uh, coming for one side too much, but making sure that people are properly addressing things and calling people on debate tricks to the greatest extent that you can, I, th I think that's pretty important. And so they, they do a pretty good job on that. They don't always catch some of the more complicated debate tricks, and you do end up having accomplished debaters like Dinesh D'Souza, um, who often make arguments that don't really make a lot of sense. And uh, they, But you have to do at least a moderate level of trickery for them to uh, let it slide. Um, so, yeah, uh, but this, this debate had a pretty bad topic. And the, the yes side of the argument really was pretty stupid. Uh, they're, they're arguing, uh, they just made lo logical fallacy after logical fallacy. And there was a certain amount of frustration by the audience as well as the, uh, as the, um, as the moderator, um, I think. In, in the yes side's arguments, it was basically, you need to transcend logic, yada, yada. And, and if you do, then maybe you'll believe in life after death. Um, which just, it's not a good argument to make. Uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that's wrong. It just means that if you're really going to be, uh, believing that you step beyond the point where, a, where debates can really help you move you with things, you're moving into a completely in, in uh, intuitionistic, uh, evidence lacking realm. And, uh, it's, I don't know, it, it wasn't done very well, but it, it's interesting to think about what a good debate should look like, and it's that's not the easiest question to answer. There are levels of of debate propriety or or quality, 
And civility, I think, is a baseline. You, you want to have civility. You want to have people trying to convince each other on an equal footing, good back and forth, uh, at least to the extent that that's possible. You want reasonably structured arguments. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be analytical style philosophy, but it should be philosophy of some sort. It should be a proper debate rather than people singing at each other or rejecting the premise of the debates. Uh, using logic, uh, I mean, using argumentative styles that, uh, or logical styles that don't really hold water anywhere else. Um, it, uh, you, you do want to have uh, civility, you want to have structure. Ideally, you want to be talking about a topic where reason people can disagree, people who have at least some acceptance of empiricism. Admittedly, I'm a radical empiricist. I tend to reject things that don't have, uh, or that at least stand to, uh, uh, that stand against a decent evidence. When it comes to, th uh, to different interpretations of all of the facts available to us at a time, there are some areas where I think speculation is fine. Um, it's, it gets complicated, but you want at least people living in reality, making decently structured arguments on a topic where where reasonable people can disagree. And and that's hard. And most debate that happens anywhere doesn't rise to that level of quality. Uh, and activists, I, I know I, I harp on activists a lot, but it's largely that I care so much about actually having reasonable ways to discuss uh, issues and to think about issues to not to not consider words to be a simple weapon that you'll shape where you'll do whatever it takes to win an argument uh, or whatever it takes to push a few particular points. If, if you're not aiming for broader consistency and you're not trying to convince, um, then why are you showing up? And in fact, you're harming discourse. You're damaging the way that, that we could be thinking, that the better ways of thinking that might lead to a victory for your side anyhow. Um, maybe not, but uh, you should at least make the effort. But if you're not doing that, then you're pulling people by their emotional strings away from uh, away from clear thinking. Uh, I mean, clear is always relative, but a, a, away from at least reasonably clear thinking. You're pulling them down into, into the mists of emotion, identity politics, uh, stuff like that. Whatever your goals are, there are better ways to argue for it. It doesn't mean that your goals are bad, it, yeah, but it does mean that your way of arguing after these issues is probably stupid and dangerous. And uh, and yeah, so I I think it's important to try and raise the level of discourse in society on on uh, at least most issues. There are some issues where it's not important that people ever reach consensus. What what constitutes good art? It's probably more of a, at least a semi-personal matter. I, I mean, it's not a completely subjective matter, but it's not the kind of really factual question that demands consensus. We might have a, at least a little bit of a, a use for consensus. What kinds of art are we going to fund as a society? Um, what's worth spending money on? Uh, do, you, do we want to fill our museums with random stuff? Uh, or are we going to have some some standards of art, even if they're not the only standards of art that people might use in the world? Um, it, it's important to talk about these things, but a consensus just isn't that important. Um, anyhow, yeah, I, I think finding ways to raise the level of, of discourse in, in most discussions on factual matters and trying to find ways to undermine those who are damaging our efforts to improve the, the quality of discourse at least up to a certain level. Um, I think that's important. And again, I, I, I consider myself more of a continental philosopher than an analytic. I think the, the analytics take logic too far and they forgot where it came from. They don't see logic as a tool that we created. They see it as intrinsic to the nature of things and a necessary indicator of truth or falsehood. It's not that powerful. It, it has a certain power. And we know it has a certain power because we, we kept on tuning it and altering it to, to give it a certain power. But that doesn't mean that it's omnipotent as a concept. It doesn't mean that 
if something seems to be illogical, it necessarily is wrong. Um, as empiricists, our approach to truth should be to adapt to what nature gives us. We're sitting at nature's feet. We're not dictating to nature. Anytime we dictate to nature, if we get it wrong, even if it has the most solid logic behind it, uh, behind it either our logic is wrong, uh, I mean, either the content of our logical structure is wrong, or logic itself has some flaws here. And I think we have to be open to those possibilities because our fundamental commitment is to be data-driven, not be logic-driven or philosophy-driven. I mean, talking about philosophy-driven, that's really a complicated thing. Maybe I shouldn't have quite said that, but, but the more elaborate your philosophy and the more it impacts the way that you approach issues, if it could lead you in the direction of, of preferring its own structure over new data, I mean, at least sufficient new data, then it's not performing as well as it should be. Which is part of why I prefer continental style philosophy over analytic style. The analytics tend to worship logic, whereas I just see it as a tool. I'm, I mean, in a certain sense, it's, it's like my, 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 uh, some of my thoughts in political theory. I see democracy as a tool to reach various useful social ends. It's not a goal in itself. Um, there are some social ends where it's almost the only solution, like democracy in the workplace. I, I, I think that that's tied so closely to ideas of how labor should work and people's identification with their labor that it's hard to imagine a well-structured workplace without a, a rich and vibrant inner democracy that's driving the whole show. But if there were some other way to do that, then, uh, then I would be willing to consider it. Democracy in the political realm is probably a little bit less important than, uh, than democracy in the workplace, because at least more of the interesting and difficult and personal decisions are made, uh, are they're attached to labor. Um, whereas you, you would probably prefer, at least you probably should prefer, that your governmental ideas are more of the longstanding uh, ideas in society rather than something that arose from your current generation. Um, So, on a completely different topic, recently went to the Transit Museum and picked up this mouse pad, which I just think is absolutely hilarious. Um, it's gigantic. Uh, this is the size of a mouse up next to it. Um, I just think I, I saw it and I got a really good giggle out of it, and it's, it's unfortunately expensive, but I think it would be really kind of cute to, to bring it to the subway sometime and just pretend to be confused why I can't swipe it to get into... Uh, uh, to get into the subway, but but yeah, it was it's fantastic. Um, I, I I went there to uh, to pick up a uh, a shower curtain that has a map of the subway system on it. The the transit museum it's really a fantastic museum. You, you they have lots and lots of old cars in an, uh, in what used to be an active subway station that was closed I think in the sixties maybe or seventies. Um, got renovated into a museum. I think it was only initially meant to be a short-term exhibit, but it turned out to be so popular that they left it open. People get memberships. And if you're a member, you can go on uh, on the occasional tour that they do, either a walking tour, I've done a few of those, or uh, tours of closed portions of the, uh, of the subway system, either things that have since been closed, like the... Uh, the Manhattan City Hall station, or uh, or things that were never open to the public, uh, like I, I got to see a substation that powers uh, bits of the um, of the subway system. It powers the third rail. Um, uh, several months ago, it, it really was cool. Um, got some great photos. If you go on my Google Plus, you'll find a lot of this stuff. Uh, if you look through the photos section. Um, yeah, that really cool mouse pad. I've never regretted being a member of the Transit Museum. It's it's just a cool place to go and uh, hang out down there, sit in some of the old cars, look up at the uh, at the old adverts that they have there, and just kind of imagine what it would be like to be on one of the trains when it's moving. Well, that's another type of tour that they sometimes do, where you can um, uh, you can ride on one of their uh, their nostalgia trains. 
Some of these are open to the general public. Some of them are uh, uh, are member specific. But yeah, those old trains when they get going, they're they're noisy. Uh, they often have like uh, things that look like ceiling lights and fans above your head. They're not usually in perfect condition. They they creak, they move, but but they're they're fun. It's neat to be on one of those old things. And imagine what the city used to be like. Uh, for all the, the New Yorkers in the 1920s, 40s, 60s, even 1900s, um, and moving around the city. Um, so I, I did want to mention something that, uh, that I find somewhat disturbing. Uh, a friend of mine from uh, Columbus, or maybe I should say acquaintance, I don't know, uh, not really important to haggle over the details of these things, uh, but uh, she recently had the unpleasant experience of having somebody accidentally text, me, uh, text message her, uh, and then the person didn't just say, oops, I'm sorry, goodbye. They, they went back and forth and eventually sent her, uh, th this, this dude sent her pictures of his penis. Disgusting. Um, and uh, I just find it bizarre that, that people would do this kind of thing. I mean, it's not not cool obviously and then today somebody posted about uh how some people are getting harassed uh i mean you, you end up getting people harassed into some people will ask for dates and stuff on linkedin which if you as you probably but don't necessarily know it's a site for people to share um, business networking opportunities it's kind of like a facebook but uh career oriented um People will establish links, rate each other on their skills. Uh, they essentially post a resume on there. It's one of the better uh, ways, or at least one of the reasonable ways, to get uh, to get a job uh, nowadays. Um, but yeah, it's just totally inappropriate to be asking for dates on such a site. Um, but I, I'm just weirded out by the way that some people behave on the internet. It's, I mean. Uh, maybe there are some reasons which which they do this, which have a certain kind of logic of their own. Uh, it's not like there's a high cost to being inappropriate on the internet. People generally won't track you down and yell at you. And I guess under some weird circumstances, maybe somebody would a a agree to go on a date, or maybe somebody's letting off steam, or who knows? It's just it's even if. Even if you don't think that there are necessarily negative consequences for your behavior, for your bad behavior, um, partly because you're not going to get caught or people are distant or remote, you still generally in society should try to behave in ways that you hope most people would behave. Don't litter if you're walking through a park late at night and no one will see you because it's still, it's still a park. People, you, you should understand that people generally like to go to, uh, go to a park to see, to feel like they're in nature. They're trying to have a, an enjoyable time. You might be walking through that park again later, but even if you're not, you're making the world a worse place for other people for no decent reason. I mean, we don't have to live in a way where we're always trying to make the world maximum good for everybody uh, else, but generally you probably should have some kind of a reason um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do some, uh, something, and if, if there's little cost, then why would you why would you do that kind of thing? Why would you send somebody, text somebody a, a picture of your, your penis? Why would you uh, nag somebody about, uh, about dating on a career-oriented site? Uh, why would you litter in the park? Why would uh, just, you should have some decent reason do these things, and I, I, I just think generally these things are inexcusable. You shouldn't do that. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not the way that that any reasonable person would uh, would behave. I mean, I, I'm not saying that. I, admittedly, there are some times in life when when there are acts that some uh, that seem questionable, but somebody might have a decent reason, and we should probably give people a lot of uh, a slack. Uh, there are some activists that have. Again, to our fun activists, unusual notions of uh, of what's appropriate, and they like to lecture people about how to behave and stuff in areas where uh, where the other person just might reasonably have have decided, oh, you know, that's okay. I actually like 
being treated that way or I don't mind being treated that way. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, like if you're gonna get all shouty about people flirting in elevators, uh, I've known some people who have gotten together, embarrassingly perhaps, because they flirted in an elevator. It, it happens. People flirt in all sorts of situations. If the person doesn't like the flirting, ideally they'll say, uh, I'm not interested, and the other person will back the hell off. But you don't yell at them just for starting and trying and seeing if, if there's an interest. But but no, this, this kind of stuff, uh, the littering or... Um, flirting on LinkedIn, uh, mm. or uh, sending people you don't know who were the result of the wrong number of pictures of your bits, that's, uh, it's, that really can't be justified. Um, and I guess one of the things, so I am on OkCupid, uh, um, and I'm, I help a little bit, as often happens, I eventually find my find my way into some kind of a community helper role. And I'm one of the many people who acts as a flag mont. That is somebody who digs through all of the reported abuses on, uh, on the service and, um, and looks at the policies and uh, votes or marks the, uh, the flags as being valid or invalid. And you, you usually just end up seeing some people who probably didn't read the rules or something like that. Uh, somebody might take a picture of their dog and stick it on their profile pic, and they're not present in the picture. So you say, uh, not the user, delete, click, done. Uh, and a whole bunch of people add their annotations, and presumably some OkCupid okay staff member will then go look over the whole lot and uh, then decide whether to delete, uh, to delete or keep or whatever. The, the bad content. Um, you occasionally end up having some people who are like utterly opposed to the idea that websites have rules. And they'll be like, no, I have a right to do this, or God, give me a break. Uh, this person has three good photos, so they should be allowed to take a picture of their iguana or a sunset or something on their profile pic. Uh, and you know, I, I hope that eventually the OkCupid okay staff uh, ejects those uh, the people who annotate the, uh, things that way, but um, but yeah, again, occasionally you end up having random dudes, usually not not only dudes, but people who decide to stick up essentially porn pics of, of themselves on the site, and uh, I. I'm surprised that people would do that, but I guess just some people have really weird notions about how interesting bodies are, and uh, they want to show off their bits. Maybe it's a way of letting off steam, maybe they're Aspies, or otherwise mentally off, who knows. Um, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird to see people who don't have at least a reasonable understanding of the way that people interact, what social boundaries are, yada yada. I, I, t I tend to find that kind of thing really frustrating, occasionally seeing people in real life who have those kinds of problems. Uh, and it's not usually pleasant to be around them. Um, although sometimes they realize some somebody gives them a good talking to, or they somehow realize that, that this is an issue, and they take steps to correct it. I mean, if they do have some kind of mental illness, so then sometimes they have tricks, and there are whole websites devoted to having people with various mental illnesses and, uh, and defects, helping them correct for these things so that they can function better in society. And that's great. Um, I, because although I tend to often find it frustrating when they don't find ways to, to fix these uh, or to at least adapt to these problems, um, they deserve to be happy too. Uh, the presence of a defect should not make somebody's life terrible. And if people can find a way to work around their defects, that's fantastic. And also, it, it's not like we don't all have some defects. I have a heart condition, for example. Uh, it's, uh, I occasionally have issues with depression. You know, yeah, I, I have my own uh, list of of defects of various sorts. I mean, even being left-handed is a defect by, by some uh, metrics. 
but you cope. And people generally should be willing to talk about defects as defects, not get defensive or certainly don't get proud of your defects, but um, find ways to still live a good life if you can with your defects. Um, and, and certainly don't leave them untreated if they're going to cause you to leave others to be miserable or feel like they're mistreated. Uh, like, again, showing people your bits, not cool. Probably a sign that you're mentally not working right. Fix it. Um, so, I've done a reasonable amount of work on classes. This last week, I um, I did a uh, at least a first draft of the kind of contents uh, I need to make my occasional teaching Unix to people to make it more organized and complete. So I went to a coffee shop, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, and just spent a few hours banging out uh, a the outline and some of the content for uh, for 10 classes in, in an intro to Unix course. And since then, I've been working over that uh, that text, trying to start to hammer it into shape so that it really starts to feel like a good outline. Because again, I've, I've taught this stuff to people before, but not in an organized way. And I would like for it to be more organized so that I can use, so that I can like put some time into perfecting the metaphors that I use just really get this content up to a good level, and I'm going to be teaching or uh, putting some of those classes on YouTube as well. Um, I mentioned this on Google Plus. Um, if you look, you can see at least the the first uh, the first draft that I did of of the content. Um, it's a gigantic text document, um, and uh, and I've done some work on it since. I still have a lot of work to do, but it's it's fun. It's coming along pretty well. Um, I'm, uh, I know at least some of what I'll be teaching in each class uh, and how I'm going to be teaching it. Uh, I might shuffle some things around between classes and even between courses. I'm, I, I realize that some topics don't belong in an introductory course and my initial super, super brief outline, like one sentence for each uh, class in the course, uh, have proved to be a little bit long in some areas. Like teaching people about raids in uh, introductory to, uh, or in an introductory uh, class about Unix, or introductory course about Unix, not really doable. Um, in a future, uh, or I mean, in a later course, certainly, but but you can't teach that stuff off the bat. Um, I just, um, but yeah, writing ten ten sentences, uh, moving from that to having ten rough lesson plans. Uh, that's. Uh, you you really uh, you realize a lot more about the order in which you can teach things, um, and yeah, it's. I'm hoping when I actually taught people these things before that I didn't teach them in really terrible orders. I don't remember well enough, but yeah, teaching it, it it's an art. There's a lot of uh, of difficult work that uh, that goes into putting together a class. Uh, you think and you think and you work over stuff endlessly, tweaking metaphors. Uh, moving content around, figuring out how to phrase things. It's a lot of work, and I guess I'm appreciating uh, the teachers that um, that I had earlier in life a lot more. But with all this work, I've um, come to need at least some more relaxation time. I've been looking for a good game, probably a computer game of some sort. I've been playing a little bit of uh, Final Fantasy VI. I think I might have mentioned it in uh, in, in one of the, uh, the past blogs. Um, there's an Android port, um, but I'm getting a little bit bored with it. I'm trying to. I guess it would be nice to have a completely new game in the Final Fantasy series, or maybe also like the Final Fantasy Tactics Advance uh, uh, game uh, and and its sequel and. The, the Disgaea series of games. It would be neat to have another game like that. Also really loved Fallout 3 uh, and its sequel, but some kind of game like that, I think that would be perfect. I've been looking around on, on Steam to try and figure out if, if there are good games that I just haven't heard about. Since I'm not really much of a gamer, uh, it's 
not that I don't like the game, it's just that there are just too many other things to do. Uh, and just if I start a game and if I start to get uh, immersed into it, I'm going to want to play it all the way through to the end. And that just takes a lot of time away from everything else. Um, I am looking forward to the new uh, Wolfenstein uh, New Order uh, game. That's, I think it's going to be good. I hope it's, it's good. Um, I guess another game that I liked was, uh, was the Darksiders series. But unfortunately, the company that published it uh, it went out of business, and I'm not sure. Somebody else, uh, I, I'm sure, bought their uh, bought the series and all the intellectual property assets and stuff from them. But no idea if there's going to be a Darksiders three. Um, the thing I liked about Darksiders is that it felt a lot like um, as all the sixty four, which was quite a good game, um, and it inspired a lot of other good Zelda games. Yeah, Darksiders felt a lot like Zelda. Um, uh, but it also had a more uh, more interesting uh, mythos that they created uh, around it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I don't know. Maybe there'll be another game in that series sometime. Um, job wise, things are going pretty well. I'm currently talking with two companies. Uh, I had an on site with one of them yesterday, and uh, I was pretty impressed. They they work. They have interesting challenges. They have. Uh, really neat offices. Um, they have a good gender and racial balance in the office, which is pretty important to me. Uh, I guess one of the problems that I had with my most recent job was that it was just like six guys in an office. And uh, there's a lot more frustration than I have um, with the specifics of how that worked out. But I'm not going to talk about them uh, in public. But, um, but yeah, having, having diversity in the office, uh, racial diversity, uh, having people of both genders around, having uh, at least the feeling that, that there's, there's a, a safety in, uh, in not, being, uh, not being straight or safety in having a variety of interests outside of work. Uh, I, I'm not saying that all these were false necessarily in any past job that I worked, but it's nice to to feel that you're in a place that that is diverse and big, and and this this was really a neat neat place, neat technical challenges. I feel that potentially I could go very far in that company. Um, and then next week uh, I I have an onsite with another company, which uh, probably will also be pretty cool. And uh, hopefully I'll be uh, I'll get two offers. Maybe I'll just get one offer, um, but I'll, I'll find out. And uh, hopefully I'll be employed again very soon. It's nice to at least have some confidence that I'm going to be. Uh, I, I guess one of the things that you don't realize when you're working is how much you would miss work uh, if uh, if uh, when you're uh, when you're not doing it for a while. And teaching, it's fulfilling, but there's something nice about going to an office every day and having people around who, who are at least uh, you'll see all the time. And uh, I mean, ideally, I have a lot more experience with the university where you end up having a lot of really people very skilled, people who need help, pe people who are better than you at things who, where you can learn from them. Uh, Lots of interesting ideas floating around, good culture, stuff like that. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I miss. Um, and I'm hoping to be, uh, to be back in a workplace regularly again uh, soon. Um, it's been a nice little break, but uh, after a few months, you, it begins to get old. Plus, it's nice to have money. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the job, job hunt is coming, hopefully coming to a close. Um, at, at least provided that uh, things don't go belly up uh, with, with both of them. But I don't think they will. Uh, at least I'm reasonably confident. And I'm reasonably confident that both, both companies have interesting technical challenges and good people. And that's, those are the two things that I really care a lot about. There are other things that I care about, uh, of course. And some of them are areas where I wouldn't really want to work for a company if they didn't have them. But but really, those are the two most important things. I'm 
probably going to avoid startups, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, given, given things. Um, I've, yeah, I've still been experimenting with cooking with avocados. Um, I really want to try some more, uh, making some more sweet things with avocados. I've been doing a lot of savory cooking with avocados. And avocados, at least if you grew up with the food traditions that I, I grew up in, you think of them mainly as a savory type, uh, type food. Um, you think guacamole, you think... Uh, cr well, crepes don't have to, avocados don't have to be sweet in crepes, but they can be. Uh, you, you think about them maybe in dosa, although I don't know if dosa, I don't know if Indian food actually typically used avocados or if that, or if it only started doing it recently. I'm going to have to look that up. But, um, but yes, uh, there are some cultures that, that do sweet things with avocados, and I really, really would like to try that sometime soon. Um, on OK Cupid, that's that's a weird. Uh, since I mentioned it earlier, I, I keep on wondering if I'm too bitter at this point to really fall in love. I mean, recently I, I met two pretty neat people um, on on the site, and chances are reasonable I'm going to be at least friends with one or both of them. But I just I keep wondering. Maybe it's just a little bit of depression, which I've been dealing with again recently, but there's just so much bitterness and pessimism about entering relationships that I feel. That, I guess just, maybe it's just that most of my relationships have mostly not worked very well. And I keep on wondering, can they work well? Are there areas where I'm just too messed up to, to deal with people? in the long run, or, I mean, maybe some of it is just the philosophical stances that I've taken, but I also, I just don't trust people very easily, and falling head over heels, I'm so nervous about it, and it ha seems to happen so infrequently, but I don't want to end up alone, and is it, do I wait until I fall head, to, head over heels with someone, despite myself? Uh, I just don't know. And... I guess I've still been chewing over, I might have mentioned this a few weeks ago, maybe not, how one would have a system of ethics that could deal with either either or both time travel and like this branch, uh, branching dimensions uh, notion, which, I mean, some people keep on talking about as a quantum physics uh, idea, but you don't need quantum physics to, uh, to have this idea of branching realities uh, that that any time, uh, like any time variance in what could happen uh, would occur that uh, that you would end up having some kind of a branch. I mean, maybe it's a lot easier to mentally approach it as a, as a physical theory, but it doesn't have to be a physical theory. It can be a permutation theory uh, in that if you think that, that just streaming together of of, uh, of potential permutations, if that's enough to define a timeline. And I mean, maybe even if you go further and say that as far as we know, we're only apparently exploring uh, a physical reality, but maybe uh, we're really just exploring permutations and there doesn't, ha there doesn't have to be a single real reality. There, there are just endless, um, endless uh, uh, ways to thread uh, uh, to thread a story between all of the potential permutation data points uh, uh, that, that are out there. And I mean, it does take you in weird directions, but it's, it's still, if, if you allow for probability to be uh, oh, um, some kind of way to determine thickness of, of strands of, of possibility, of reality being cleaved in a uh, in a temporal probab uh, probabilistic sense, then what you have is a framework for uh, which which uh, a framework of reality that behaves pretty much identically to the physical theory of reality, um, but has a, a radically different understanding of 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 prob uh, probability, or at least it, it puts it in a different context. 
um, even if it's functionally the same um, or more or less the same. But it, it would potentially uh, leave one with different answers for how to approach morality. Could we create a morality that's coherent over, uh, over this idea um, that would recognize the peculiarities of, of this underlying framework? Um, and it's, it's tough. It's, it's a weird, uh, it, it's, it's, it's at least an oddly different way of looking at things. But one of the things about philosophy is that I, I one of the reasons why I think philosophy isn't necess, isn't usually particularly coherent, uh, or coherent is the wrong word, convergent, is that we judge philosophies by how well they let us make sense of the world and how compatible they are, at least I do, with, with empiricism. Mm -hmm. And if you end up having two theories that both make pretty adequate uh, sense of the world, that really are uh, um, compatible with all of the, uh, the data that you have available to you, that have good uh, predictive power, uh, or at least good apparent predictive power, and all that, then, then if you have two people who each have different uh, philosophies that that meet those qualities well enough, then there really isn't a particularly strong reason to choose between them. I mean, you, you could try and develop frameworks that would help you choose between them, Occam's razor, things like that, but Occam's razor isn't as sharp as people say it is. Um, it doesn't really narrow you down to one currently best idea. It narrows you down, it chops off a lot of bad, idea, uh, bad ideas, but so uh, if in order to really make it sharp, you, you have to accept certain relatively arbitrary positions um, to, uh, to help you decide, like, what does it really mean for something to be simplest? And my, at least uh, to the extent that I accept Occam's razor, the version of it that I accept is not particularly sharp. Um, so... Yeah, I don't think I, I really could m uh, make a great argument to choose between the theory that there is a single physical universe and we are exploring it, and probability is about what actually will happen in that universe, um, or at least uh, building the, the best model for that universe. I don't think I could really easily choose between that and the notion that uh, that that we're a probability weighted um, thread, uh, one of many possible threads through the permutation space of possible universes, and that our seeming, that the seeming uh, rules of, of, prob uh, of prob uh, probability in physics aren't rather notions of the, uh, whether thickness, or I'm, I'm sorry, whether probability and physics are not just uh, the thickness of strands in, in that permutation space. I don't think I could really mount a great argument to, to prefer one or the other. Um, I mean, we're exploring an apparent reality, and what seems to be the most solid are, uh, uh, in, in our understanding of that are the things close to the data rather than the larger interpretation of things. So, going over the, la uh, the last week, what has been going on? Last uh, Sunday is actually, I think, when I did the, uh, when I recorded the last video. I I've learned that on Fridays I'm not always either feeling like recording the video, or sometimes I'm tired or really busy that day. Um, I still generally see Friday as a good target. It's not always going to be on Friday, on, uh, but yeah, on, on last Sunday, uh, I I helped um, helped at Gen Space for a bit. Last Monday, I came back for um, a meeting at, at Gen Space for what's going to potentially be a group entry into the iGEM competition, uh, competition, which is a uh, it's a genetics theme scientific uh, community or school competition to come up with the best project, and um, and this year they they opened it up to uh, to communities, and uh, so a lot of the people who are affiliated some uh, some way with with GemSpace are going to be entering as a community uh, team. 
I'm hoping that it'll be organized well enough that we'll actually manage to do something. But so far, we haven't been particularly great at, uh, at organizing online. I'm going to try and meet every Monday. I'm not sure how often I'm going to necessarily be able to make that because my Mondays, it seems like every meetup in the world wants to meet on Mondays. Speaking of which, I need to hold my meetup again once I start having an income because it's been several months and I really, I enjoyed running my meetup on philosophy. I, I have to get back into that. Um, let's see. But yeah, the, the meeting went fine. Uh, it, there's a whole bunch of really bright people who might not be great at organizing things, which is always a challenge trying to produce content with that. It takes a certain amount of strong leadership, and I'm not sure we have that at the moment. But we'll see. Uh, I went to a member's open house at the American Museum of Natural History on Tuesday, and that was fantastic. I mean, really, really top-notch. Um, uh, AMNH has been experimenting with its member content uh, recently, and, and this open house, they do it once a year. They have people from many of the departments of the, uh, uh, of the uh, museum, which, as I've mentioned many times before, it's now more of a research institute than a museum. Uh, they offer uh, graduate degrees. They do a lot of uh, a lot of research. They have big, big departments that that do scientific uh, research and uh, and uh, some humanities research. Um, I guess I mean what, what what would you call archaeology? Is it a science? It's something that's like a science. It's close to being a science. It's a empirical discipline. I wouldn't really call it a science. Uh, but it's close to being one. But yeah, they have big departments doing a lot of research at uh, at um, at AMNH, and so they had many of those departments come and present uh, at uh, at the members open house. Uh, this was this happened after normal hours. Uh, non members weren't uh, weren't still in the museum, and uh, there were presentations in in one hall and uh, and. What else did we do? We went so, and as usual, there there, uh, there were some some peanuts and wine. I mean, some mixed nuts and wine, uh, and soda. So we had that. Uh, there was in in the hall. Yeah, they had the different departments presenting. Then we came back out, went to the hall of human origins, and then uh, and into the geology area, where they had um, docents, which are I guess topical experts who are sometimes employed by uh, by museums and sometimes their volunteers but they had docents ex uh, ex uh, talking a, a lot about some of the exhibits in the Hall of Human Origins uh, and in the geology hall they also had um, uh, had people talking about uh, Neanderthal uh, uh, DNA and, and schools and stuff uh, in in one of the uh, learning labs off in the side there and then afterwards, we went and saw what was a, a, relatively, a relatively new and absolutely top-notch presentation about, uh, about a topic which I've actually talked about occasionally. Um, the wonders that are in the world all around us that we can't see because of how our eyes work. And so, uh, so this was a, a presentation with 3D glasses where... Um, where they talked about different uh, visual spectra and different time spectra and size uh, spectra. So they uh, they talked about like infrared, ultraviolet, uh, the ability to see heat, flowers, bees, things uh, like that. They uh, zoomed in to uh, zoomed in to things on a uh, on a microscopic level, down to a molecular level, talked about microscopy, uh, micros, microscopy, 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 micros, microscopy. Uh, difficult, difficult word. Um, microscopy, microscopy, microscopy. Yeah, I think microscopy. Um, uh, and. Uh, and talked about some of the recent uh, uh, advances in the sciences that allow us to manipulate things on a, mole a mole molecular and atomic level. Um, talked about different time scales. Uh, it was particularly cool seeing 
a lot of the time-lapse uh, photography that helps us understand how plants move and grow. Um, but yeah, it was really well put together. And I, it's the kind of thing where if I were asked to approach that topic, uh, I, it was very similar to the, at least on the rough outline level, how I would teach on, uh, on that topic. The one, one thing which it didn't really go into is optics, seeing things that are very, very large, like uh, astronomy, uh, things like that. But that's okay. Um, they, they covered so much ground, it, it would be hard for them to cover uh, everything imaginable. Um, on Wednesday, I was thinking about going to a Psy Cafe on Ants, but I ended up uh, being too busy working on class uh, materials. Uh, yesterday, I had the on-site, which ended up taking most of the day. Um, later today, I'm going to a member's event at the Guggenheim, uh, where uh, they're going to be... Uh, I'm, I'm going to see the Italian Futurism exhibit again, which I mean, I've already seen it maybe three times at, at members' events, or no, twice at members' events, and once with a friend. But it is such a fantastic exhibit that seeing it one final time, I think, is, is worthwhile. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that later today. Um, and uh, oh yes, also, I think I, I mentioned last week I, I went to a Kickstarter party, but I found out when looking up uh, the, the place that had delicious bourbon paste uh, um, dessert treats that they um, they have stuff at Smorgasburg, which I think is part of the Brooklyn Flea, which is a gigantic flea market that's held in, in Brooklyn um, every weekend. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to have to, hopefully this weekend, I'll, I'll track them down and go to Brooklyn Flea and, uh, and have some of those uh, yeah, uh, treats again. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what's been going on, what I've been thinking about. Uh, again, if there are any questions or ideas for topics, uh, things like that, um, uh, let me know. Uh, I, I do a lot of, I, there are some top, there's a certain amount of overlap between this and what I talk about on Google+. Uh, so if you, if you watch both, apologies for the overlap. If you don't watch both and you want to see more, I, I more often talk about interesting scientific advances that I'm reading about on Google+, Plus, or I rant a little bit more on politics. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's what's been going on. Uh, see you next week.